scorches through everything And does away with much It explains a lot Though not what most of us would like to hear Is that there is no free will Free versus fixed will. Ah, in the whole, you're just afraid of being unfree, but hey, look, behold, there is still so much beauty. It's a sublime law, indeed. Otherwise, what beauty could there be? So here the coin's other side speaks, a toss-up weighted equally. It's from the searched finding of truth, not of fright, though determinism is really not a very pretty sight. Beauty exists either way, for there is still novelty. But determined's opposite is of an impossible currency. How dare you curse the freedom to be? It's because you are scared of he. What greater proof of inner freedom then could his gift of wild flight to us send? Really, it not of a scare that he is there, but because random cannot even be there. For then on nothing would things depend, all bare, if it could even be, but it has no clothes to wear. I swear I am more, that I do act freely, don't pass off my passion so calculatingly. I'll let the rams butt their heads together. One absolute position subsides for its brother. Yes, it seems that we can choose even otherwise. But what's within, as the top floor of being wise, knows not the hidden non-apparent floor below. And so it's a second story, having only one window. One rigid mode of thought score consumes the other with folklore. Unbending, unyielding with perfect defense, to orchestrate life's symphony at the song's expense. We're happy to just find out the truth. However, when subjected to the proof, we wish that the coin could stand on its edge and see that it cannot, which is knowledge. So let's define the world and human existence on a couple hundred years of material witness or burn the measuring eye to the stake. After all, our freedom's what it seeks to forsake. Evolution didn't work by chance for us to live, for natural selection is the scientific alternative to intelligent design from something outside. The coin of determination has no other side. The secret is simply that a secret does exist, and no amount of data can take away this. But this doesn't mean a ghost in the machinery. But perhaps the heart isn't just a pump, the liver a refinery. We often forget the secret willingly in order to live life excitingly, which it still would be either way, as we're still part of the play anyway. But of course there is a past of weathers, through which we've been weathered. Surely we are moved as dust from gust to gust, but is two twice two as four always a must? Math too is a must, and we try as ever, to predict a week ahead the weather. Yet the data seem to much to work with, but indetermination measures not random's width. Is not an unfree will a blatant contradiction developed from the unenlightened conviction? If I've made a choice, then I have willed it, and if it's been willed, then freedom's fulfilled it. This what I mean, that the will, willed oneself, which is that one does not, will the will itself. The neurons vote based on who one is. No one else is there to answer the quiz. And of course it's in and of a misguided pit to say that from the past we've distilled it. Is not the idea of complete self-autonomy a ruse born from the illusion of the existentialist blues? We distill what comes into us too, for it has to become part of us, new, for mirror neurons act it out while we are still invading our sanctum and altering the will. But of course, this is to be much expected from a culture that lacks all mythical perspective. Nonsense, we call it, a virtue of not thinking, from which we have long since been departing. So now we'll behold in all its transparency, beyond childish ideals of essence and archaic fantasy. That's close, but it's thinking that has grown by science and logic informed from reason sown, in place of feeling, sensation wishes and the pleas to have the universe be what it ought to be. Do not distort with a desire for meaning. 
Oh, the babe, let's leave the child a weaning. But I ask of you, have you not tried in betweening? There are two ways of living, sometimes merging. One of just state of being, of its only showing. And one of the being, plus the underknowing, as with our life's wife, we dwell not on hormoning. And in that same breath we say all is forgiven. Why hold humans responsible, leading to derision? Of course an eye for an eye was an unjust decision. Well, we have a system that draws a line between a crime of passion and a thought-out, sought-for infliction. The universe made me do it, says the accused. And the judge replies, well, this does excuse, but I still have to sentence you to the pen until the universe can't make you do it again. Why must it be a question of absolute freedom as complete randomness over an unbending system that structures everything that ever was, is, and will be right down to the elementary structures of incomprehensibility. What is set forth in the beginning is ever of itself continuing, restrained by time, yes, but unfolding. For there is nothing else in putting. I may understand why this has to be. I have felt the rapture of black and white toxicity. But why subjugate all possibility for novelty? It will still be novel, even such as a new parking lot. For the dopamine neurotransmitters will stir the pot. New is still new on the grand tour through life. Then do some predicting to then avoid some strife. Can such a thought hope to cast a wrench into these gears? A tool so heavy that dissuades all of our fears? Will all order and inertia be torn asunder? Will we have giant ants wearing top hats over, with all rationality considered a blunder? The truth was not sought to drop a spanner into the works, but it even turns out to grant more of compassion's perks for those afflicted with the inability for learning, thus eliminating the great annoyances burning. Am I simply a delusional puddle here? Perceiving just my liquid perimeter as I think to myself I can control the very rain that expands my rule, and the humidity that thins, should I condemn as that which sins? There are no sins but just destiny's fate, which even includes one's learnings of late. We and all are but whirlpools, of the same oscillations, some lasting longer yes but of the same instantiations. Outputs without inputs cannot ever be or the actions would pop randomly. Yet to some people that's the enemy. A useless state that's not here, thankfully. Does free will truly exist? Or are our lives merely a series of predetermined events? An age-old debate, one that has been at the heart of philosophical discourse for centuries. Today, we delve into this debate through an enlightening dialogue between Omar a free-thinking questioner and a wise, poetic cleric. The cleric, a firm believer in free will, argues that determinism is a beautiful law. He states that the existence of beauty is a testament to our freedom. He challenges Omar, accusing him of being afraid of the concept of determinism. Omar, however, views things differently. He argues that beauty exists regardless of determinism. He posits that the opposite of determinism is impossible and the idea of randomness holds no water. Or the cleric defends his stance, asserting that the ability to act freely is a gift. He believes that Omar's denial of free will stems from a fear of a higher power. The cleric insists that the freedom to act is a testament to our inner freedom. Omar counters this, stating that his argument isn't rooted in fear, but rather in the search for truth. He suggests that, if everything were random, nothing would depend on anything else, creating a chaotic and baseless existence. The cleric passionately defends his belief in free will accusing Omar of reducing his passions to mere calculations. He believes that one absolute position should not consume the other. Omar, in response, 
explains that our perceived ability to choose is merely an illusion, a second story, with only one window. He suggests that our understanding is limited by our inability to see the hidden, non-apparent floor below. The cleric, undeterred, argues against a rigid mode of thought, accusing it of consuming the beauty of life's symphony. Omar, however, is content in his pursuit of truth. He acknowledges the desire for the coin to stand on its edge, a metaphor for the coexistence of free will and determinism, but asserts that this is impossible. The cleric criticizes reliance on material evidence, suggesting that the pursuit of scientific proof seeks to forsake our freedom. Omar retorts with the concept of evolution. He argues that natural selection, not chance, led to our existence, reinforcing his belief in determinism. The cleric, however, maintains that the existence of a secret or unknown element in life suggests the possibility of a ghost in the machinery, implying the existence of free will. Omar acknowledges this, stating that we often forget the secret in order to live life excitingly. He believes that we're part of the play of life, regardless of determinism or free will. The cleric questions the absolute nature of determinism, asking if 2 plus 2 always has to equal 4. Omar asserts that math is a necessity, and just like predicting the weather, the data may be overwhelming but it does not measure randomness. The cleric argues that an unfree will is a contradiction. He maintains that if a choice has been made, then it has been willed, and if it has been willed, then freedom has been fulfilled. In response, Omar posits that the will is not something one controls, suggesting that the concept of free will is fundamentally flawed. In conclusion, the debate between Omar and the cleric encapsulates the ongoing philosophical discourse surrounding free will and determinism. It's a complex issue, one that challenges our understanding of ourselves and our place in the world. And while the debate continues, perhaps the most important takeaway is this, the pursuit of truth, regardless of where it leads us, is a journey worth undertaking. In this engaging debate, we've explored the concept of free will as it relates to poetry. Omar, our poetic contender, argues that we distill the world around us, creating a unique perspective influenced by our experiences. He believes that this process gives birth to our sense of self, and, consequently, our free will. On the other hand, the poetic cleric challenges this view, suggesting that our sense of self and free will are illusions, born from a culture lacking mythical perspective. The cleric proposes that our actions are not driven by free will, but are instead the result of a structured system that has been in place since the beginning of time. The debate then shifts to the realm of responsibility, morality, and justice. Omar discusses how our judicial system delineates between crimes of passion and premeditated acts, suggesting that the latter is a manifestation of free will. The cleric, however, counters this by questioning the idea of absolute freedom and the randomness it implies. Omar then introduces the concept of novelty, arguing that new experiences stir our senses and contribute to our sense of free will. The cleric, however, remains skeptical, questioning whether novelty can disrupt the established order. In the end, the debate leaves us with a profound question. Are we merely perceiving our reality through a lens shaped by our experiences and cultural influences? Or are we truly free agents capable of shaping our own destiny? This is the enigma that lies at the heart of the free will debate, a concept that continues to inspire poets and philosophers alike. The Free Will Poetry Slam Debate is a testament to the power of words and the depth of thought that can be achieved when we use poetry as a tool to explore complex philosophical concepts. 
Whether you agree with Omar or the poetic cleric, one thing is certain, the debate on free will is far from over. Does free will truly exist? Or are we simply pawns in a cosmic game of chess? This is the thought-provoking question that sparks the conversation between our two protagonists, Omar and the cleric, in a debate that dances around the delicate intricacies of fate and freedom. In a poetic exchange, the cleric surrenders his secrets to Omar, eager to hear his perspective on the matter. He concedes, Omar, the secret is what you reveal. I've nothing else. I to you yield. You may expound on what's real. Later on, I may still play smarter along. Omar counters with an insight that challenges the common perception of free will, suggesting that it is not a fixed attribute but rather a dynamic and ever-changing phenomenon. He argues, the fixed will is dynamic and can change from learning, giving it a wider range. This statement suggests a belief in the power of knowledge and experience to influence and expand our free will, implying that our choices are not predestined, but rather shaped by our understanding and interpretation of the world around us. This debate, both enlightening and thought-provoking in its essence, brings to light two different perspectives on the concept of free will. On one hand, the cleric's perspective seems to lean towards a more deterministic view of the world, while Omar, on the other hand, champions the idea that free will is not a constant, but a variable that can be influenced and expanded through learning and experience. In conclusion, the debate between Omar and the cleric presents a nuanced exploration of the concept of free will. It challenges us to question our own beliefs and to consider the possibility that our will may not be as free as we might like to believe. However, it also offers a glimmer of hope, suggesting that through learning and personal growth, we may be able to expand the boundaries of our free will and exercise greater control over our own destiny. As we navigate the complexities of the world and grapple with the challenges that life throws our way, may we always remember the power of knowledge and the potential it holds to shape our choices and our destiny.